Imagine opening a board game and finding this dear lady, this Bloodborne version of Tom Waits, and this penguin I dubbed Sir Timothy Wadlington III. Why does he have a suitcase? Where is he going? What's his deal? Etherfields is the next game from serial epic overpromiser Awakened Realms. They wrote such previous checks as This War of Mine, the board game, and Tainted Grail, the Fall of Avalon, both of which we've reviewed in the past, and I'll be honest with you, I'm still waiting for those checks to clear. In Etherfields, you'll plunge yourself into a hauntingly bizarre world of dreams, thick as treacle and murky as a 6am cup of coffee, and each time you wake, you're just back here again, like a record stuck in a surreal groove. If miniatures were ever a successful pitch for a board game, Etherfields is it. It's not just tacky plastic, it's an expression of ideas, and it just so happens that those ideas are a mystery. So then Etherfields is a box with a promise. Somewhere rattling inside is the key, the answer to everything. And so you open that box and you find... There's nothing quite as intimidating and disappointing as quashed enthusiasm. The very first thing you see when you open this box is hundreds and hundreds of cards, all in plastic wrappers. I know they're not right now, that's because I unwrapped them. Some telling you not to open them and others offering no instructions whatsoever. Just a bunch of card frames with artwork that doesn't give any clue to their purpose. That's where rule books come in, right? My box, in fact, had two copies of the rule book, perhaps a manufacturing error or an ill portent of things to come, gently taunting me with the idea that one rule book just might not be enough. The component list is an assault on your senses and offers no guide how to unpack and store everything. Further pages plunge you into the quicksand of uncertainty as you try to grapple on a thin branch of cohesion that slides further and further out of reach the more you read. Imagine being told about concepts like faith decks, floor decks, turn decks, dreams, slumbers, which are not the same as dreams, slum map tiles, which is not the same as the slumber deck, even though the slumber deck does have slumber tiles, just not slumber map tiles, which do sit in a deck. All of these are presented with no context, yet with constant reassurance that things, in fact, are simple, and that you shouldn't worry if you don't understand. Ironically making me more ill at ease because none of this seems simple and all of it looks uncomfortable. But Efka, you might say, isn't there a tutorial that does a fairly good job of explaining the rules? Why yes, although the tutorial and the rulebook coexist in a strange symbiosis where the tutorial expects that you've read the rulebook and the rulebook expects that you've played the tutorial. No matter which way you slice this game, it's chock full of confusion cream. In one instance, the rulebook told me that I will always begin my game on the dream world map, yet the very first time you play, when you plug in the tutorial, you start on the dreamscape rather than the dream world map, directly contradicting what the rulebook told me is a hard and fast rule. And reading this, more and more I had the suspicion that this wasn't just incompetence from whoever wrote this manual. I started to get a picture of a game that makes the rules deliberately vague. Because dreams, you see. And obviously that's just an educated guess. I can't prove to you that the designers, publishers, developers, and playtesters all thought that what this game needed was a rulebook that's as confusing as the second season of Twin Peaks. At this stage, I felt like the only reason one would have to persevere with Etherfields was because you shelled out a lot of money for it or because it was your job. Sadly, in my case, it was both. I know this isn't a comparison bursting with originality, but the more I played Etherfields, the more I saw it as a take at everything that was Gloomhaven, but framed through this idea of wandering in an absurdist theme park. 
Etherfields is a campaign game where, much like in Gloomhaven, the focus of each evening of play is a scenario, in this case called a dream, that you'll pick from a smattering that you've unlocked previously. But to access that dream, you'll first have to bimble around the world map, in this case called the Dream World, frequently encountering mini town scenarios, in this case called Slumbers. Except Etherfields isn't interested in offering you yet another dungeon crawler experience where you jump in swords blazing to murder goons. Each dream is a trundle through the vague, the abstract and the surreal. You'll solve puzzles, you'll chase things that are or aren't there, you'll step through mirrors to find yourself on the other side. The objective of each dream can range from something simple like finding a person or a way out to something completely out there like confronting your inner fears that manifest itself as a gigantic Birdman with a scythe. This Birdman would be what the game calls an entity. What's interesting here is that most of the time you can't just fight the entity, even if it scares the pajamas off of you. The best you can do is chase it away, only for it to reappear moments later. And from time to time, the game will offer ludicrous propositions, turning a mad chase for survival into a brisk stroll in the park. All you have to do to accept it is slot in a card into the slumber deck. Of course, you don't know what that card is, but you know it's not going to be good. And here's the kicker. Unlike dreams, which can be replayed but are generally one-time affairs, slumbers cycle over and over again. So that thing you just slotted into the deck might just be your next recurring nightmare. On paper, this is immediately so much more interesting than Kill the Monster of the Day. If Etherfields worked as well as it sounds, Gloomhaven would go straight into the bin. But Gloomhaven isn't in the bin, so... Look, I'm not putting this game in the bin. It's not some sort of a board game deathmatch. One of them doesn't have to go in the bin. But if one of them had to go in the bin... Let's talk about Etherfields mechanically. Instead of what do, let's explore how do. At the start of the campaign, you'll be asked to pick a character. Each of them conforms to an archetype like the gambler, who's keen on re-rolling dice, or the free spirit, whose sole response to the rulebook is, actually, I'm not sure that's true. Each character starts the game with a deck of influence cards. Each turn, you'll draw a number of cards and spend them to generate one or more of the game's resources. Awareness, cunning, and wrath. In addition to the basic functions, such as cunning letting you move, awareness letting you contact things, and wrath letting you assault things, you'll also spend them to trigger events on the dreamscape map. For example, you might find yourself near some mystical floorboards, and the map tile is telling me that to investigate those mystical floorboards, I would have to spend two wrath per player. So I spend four wrath in a two-player game, and then I reach for the book of textual paragraphs and read the prompt indicated on the map tile. It turns out that I am in school and I'm not wearing any pants. I try to run and we all know what happens next. I get one distress. Distress is one of the things that kills you. Collect eight and you're dead. Each time you run out of cards, you can reshuffle your deck, but you once again either have to take a distress or seal away cards, which are now no longer part of your deck. Run out of cards, once again, you're dead. Finally, each dream or slumber will tell you how many turns you have left, and if you run out of those, then the dream or slumber ends, but not in a good way. Let me be frank. This system is okay. Most turns, I'll be somewhere, and then I'll either have the exact right cards to investigate the prompt in front of me, or I won't. In which case, I'll either go somewhere where I do have the right cards to investigate, or I'll simply discard the ones that I don't want, keep the ones that I think are useful, and then hope that next turn, I'll get luckier. 
Spicing things up are cards I can place, meaning they're no longer circulating in my hand slash deck slash discard pile, but instead sit in front of me and provide me with a unique ability, like being able to move via diagonals, saving me a lot of time. But to place this card, I have to spend resources, and if I haven't drawn those resources in my hand, I can either just ignore it, making the ability pointless, or once again discard the resources I don't want, and once again hope that next turn I will get lucky. But wait, you can get experience points, or ether, the only indication I've encountered as to why this game is called ether fields, making it basically experience fields. On your trundles in the dream world map, you can stumble into shops where you can draw cards from a massive deck of new cards and then buy them for ether. Each card you purchase, you can then add into your deck, and that's great. We're achieving the basic criteria for a deck builder, but I think that we can all agree that what we want from a deck builder is new cards that are interesting. And these are just not. Each new ability offered on new influence cards felt circumstantial, like something I'd want to do if I drew it at the right time, on the right day, if I turned right in the right scenario. So naturally, purchasing these felt wrong. I still did it because what else do you do with Ether? But I didn't want to. On the upshot, you do get a campaign game that you can plug any of your friends into midway with a new character or even swap your character yourself. Meaning that most dreams could theoretically be completed with a character fresh out of the box. But unlike Gloomhaven, where all of that is also very much possible, there is no scaling. So any rewards you get can't be too good because then you'll be too good at the game. And that's just too much fun for you to handle. This might sound like critique, but honestly, it isn't. I've long believed that these campaign boxes have to lean one way hard, either be crunchy mechanical delights with a sprinkling of narrative like Gloomhaven, or be light and feathery in rules to make room for storytelling like Forgotten Waters. The joy of Aetherfields is discovering the puzzle behind each dream, going around different places and poking the button with your finger to see what story biscuit it throws up. If there was a crunchy system getting in the way of that, this game would be as pleasant as eating lard. The problem is that the quality of the writing and the narrative isn't much of a counterweight to all these fluffy rules. Some dreams are interesting, poignant, and funny, if a little bit too self-indulgent with on-the-nose analogies that border on the edge of cynicism, and some dreams are just crap, and some of the text is also just crap. I'll obviously be put in board game jail if I spoil anything, so let me summarize, condense, and paraphrase to give you an idea of what kind of narrative you might encounter. Oh look, it's a turtle! That's not a turtle, that's a bottle of ketchup. Don't worry, it's okay, cause you're in a dream. Or are you? On and on and on. Etherville's likes to challenge your assumptions about yourself, asking you whether there's something you want is just an opportunity for this game to trick you and say, actually, that's not something you want at all. The modus operandi here is to tell you, hey, look at this, go do this, and then you go do it, and it turns out it's something entirely different. Because dreams, and if you're particularly unlucky, there'll be a very circular puzzle that'll make you repeat yourself over and over and over and over again. I like pulling the rug from under people just as much as the next person. Heck, I like pulling the rug so much, I have half a mind to tell you that Aetherfields is our game of the year. And then be like, psych! And I think you can tell what the problem is. This stuff's cute for a while, but keep doing it and it gets stale. I remember reading on the original Kickstarter campaign page that Aetherfields is a game that will test your emotional intelligence. And I thought, huh, that's a bold claim for a game with these miniatures. But you know what they say, you can't judge a boob by its cover. And now that I finally played Aetherfields, I think I understand what it meant. Early on in the game, you'll encounter a scenario where you get attacked by and you have the option to either kill the 
or try to not kill the d And I think that's what passes for emotional intelligence here. Although if you ask me, it's less of a test of emotional intelligence and more just a test to see whether you're accidentally a psychopath because who in their right minds would murder d Remember when I said that I have a suspicion that the rulebook is deliberately vague? Well, that paints a picture of this game as a whole. There are a lot of ideas here, and it feels like the people who had these ideas thought that they were very cool. But I kind of wish that there was a person on the development team whose job it was to just say no to all of this stuff, like 50% of the time. Etherfields is an indulgence, but instead of being an indulgence by you, the person who shelled out a pretty penny for all these cards, or maybe even miniatures and accessories, it ends up being an indulgence by the designers and publishers. And you're the one who's paying for it. A lot has been said about the Etherfields board. Most of the action takes place on the dreamscape, and if I sit at the head of the table, then I'll see everything upside down, and I can't turn these tiles around because each space has special notation to tell you where to place new tiles. If I sit sideways, which is where I am right now, again, I would have to see everything sideways. And if I sat at the front of the board, which is how I'm intended to sit, then I wouldn't be sitting, I would be standing, and casting a very tired shadow. So that's obviously a problem, because the Awakened Realms team put their game so far away from me that the only thing they've awoken is my anger. But what really gets to me isn't just that they chose not to make this board modular just so they could sell a NAF playmat, it's that they had to print so many of these tile cards. To sell the game on Kickstarter, they need all the content. And of course, half of these dreams are mediocre nonsense. And if they just spent their time concentrating on the good ones, we could have had a tremendous game. But because they had to print so many of them and fit so many in the box, they're really small. And it's very hard to make out the details on them. If I tried to sit at a table and play this with friends, even if this board was modular, I could slice this bit off there would be no place to place it on the table where everyone could see clearly what was going on. In fact, there's no good space to place anything because this board is gigantic, these player boards are gigantic, this book of text paragraphs is gigantic, these two rule books, which I by now need both of them, are also gigantic and because most of the game is held in this mystical pile of cards, this box is also gigantic. And this is just me trying to play the game by myself and I can't even fit it onto the table. Could these two giant piles of cards have had their own separate trays so they wouldn't have to sit in the box? Yes. Should they have had their own separate trays so they wouldn't have to sit in the box? Yes. Awakened Realms have built up this image around themselves of selling a premium product. But the thing about premium products is not that they're pretty, because that's just vanity. It's that they are comfortable to use. And I've seen more comfort in a festival tent. I feel like I wasn't sold a game, I was sold a statistical compromise, where the driving decision was to fulfill promises listed on the Kickstarter campaign, then grand visions powered by hubris, and finally player experience a distant third. If you need more proof, let's take another look at slumbers. Remember I mentioned that your decisions during dreams will change the composition of your slumber deck, slumbers being the mini encounters you face before the actual dream. Well, that's a really neat idea. You know what isn't? The slumbers themselves. Every time you want to play a dream, you will take out all available dreams from this envelope and select one, and then that will tell you where you need to go on the dream world map except first to enter any dream you will also need keys and one of the ways of getting keys are certain spots on the dream world map so you will complete multiple revolutions trundling around except half the spots you stop on you need to complete a slumber and slumbers are not like dreams they're not puzzles you have to solve they're just a tedious slog padding to fill out the playing time. Turns out some slumbers you can forego altogether because hidden at the bottom of these entity cards is this little bit that says skip. And hidden in the rulebook, there's also a section on skipping slumbers 
A fact I found out only after I finished my time with Etherfields through the happenstance of conversing with another reviewer who also only found out that that's a rule in the game when someone pointed it out to him in the comments section of his review. So I don't know what's worse here. The fact that the rules in this game are so hidden that two professional board game reviewers couldn't spot it or that Awakened Realms knows that slumbers are so tedious that they had to work in an extra rule so that players could skip parts of their game altogether. I think what disappoints me most is that under all this box checking clutter, I kind of see that vision. I see what they were getting at, and so many of the ideas in Etherfields are great. They're just buried under a heap so deep that you couldn't even get to it if you house ruled yourself a shovel. But the worst part is that whilst I was playing Etherfields, I couldn't shake the feeling that I've already seen all of this before, that I've already explored all these ideas, and then I remembered. I have! Comanauts is a game we reviewed two years ago, and not only is it half the cost, but it's like a quarter of the rules and with a much better story. And sure, it had a whole set of its own problems, like a core system that meant you could spend like half your turns doing nothing. But the narrative payoff was miles beyond anything I've seen in Etherfields, and frankly, anything I've seen in most board games. I wanted to love this game, but when it exists in a cheaper, leaner, better form, I just don't know why I would. Etherfields is the story of the boy who cried cake. He had cake, he ate it, and then he told everyone he had a lot of cake. And then, when you bought the cake, the boy gave you an advert called a free gift, as if he was bestowing a massive boon upon you, but it was just the promise of another cake that you could fund. And thus, the cycle of Kickstarter continues because they produce one of these games a year. And no matter how many people they have working on it, it's just not enough time to make it good. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning community that offers thousands of classes on various subjects. Skillshare is your opportunity to spruce up your knowledge and level up in illustration, music, videography, writing, or interior decoration, or even board game design. It's the jumping off point for your new hobby, project, or just plain curiosity. One of the things I've always been absolutely terrible at is organization. Thankfully, on Skillshare, I found a tutorial by Thomas Frank called Real Productivity Habits That Last that taught me a lot about managing my projects and not over obsessing with perfectionism. And look at me now, this video is only three days late. And best of all, on Skillshare, there are no adverts and no limits so you can explore your creativity to your heart's content and learn as much as you like. And with an annual membership, Skillshare is less than $10 a month. The first 1,000 of our subscribers to click the link in the description and get a trial of Skillshare Premium Membership.